anyway, this evening we're going to look at a book called The Great Divorce. And um, I, I, there's a lot of confusion because it's actually not about uh, marital divorce. I remember when my younger son was uh, uh, here at Wheaton College, he had gotten married as a student. And he was going to take C.S. Lewis course from the independent study, but the, well, all my kids took classes from me when they were at Wheaton. None of them were allowed to do an independent study with me, so they did it instead with my dear friend Chris Mitchell. And so Mitchell told my son, well, go ask your dad what books to read. So that's how the class started out. He was ready to go on his honeymoon, and I said, Jeff, uh, Jeff you really need to read this book. And I handed it to him, not even thinking that I'd handed him the great divorce to read on his own honeymoon. So that probably was pretty stupid. But nevertheless, if somebody says to me, uh, where should I start if I want to read C.S. Lewis? I usually ask them, do you like fiction or nonfiction? <clears throat> I ask them questions. There's 73 books that Lewis wrote, <clears throat> 56 during his lifetime, and the rest he wrote after he died. Actually, they're collections of essays and letters that have been put together under common cover. But 73 books, uh, titles bear his name. And I'll ask questions to try and find out where they're interested and then try and direct them to the, the book that I think might fit them best. But if they don't really have any particular opinion one way or another, then I say, I think you should start with The Great Divorce. It's a great introduction to some of his thought. It's also a great introduction to his writing style. And you can pretty much read it in an evening. And I think it's also a penetrating book because it holds a mirror up to us and helps us see some of the struggles of our own soul as we read about the struggles of some of the characters in the book. Now, I want to give some background to the book before I actually begin to look at the argument of the book. Um, it's, it's a work of fiction. And, and Lewis writes in, in several places that when an author writes a book, they also long for a form that will be able to help them frame the, the content that they want to share. So uh, uh, Lewis talks about longing for a form. He said, when a man writes a love sonnet, he not only loves his beloved, but he also loves the sonnet. The sonnet is the right form that he needs. Um, he wrote an essay, sometimes fairy stories say best what needs to be said. Um, he said when he wrote his science fiction, he was trying to write romantic literature. Romantic literature is longing for a place. It, it, it comes basically from from. Virgil's um, The Aeneid, where Aeneas is longing for the home that will be, and that home will be Rome. And Virgil was trying to give the Romans a mythology for their city. And so when we talk about romantic, it's longing for Rome. It's longing for a home. It's longing for some place that's distant and remote. We haven't gotten there yet. So he said, I think science fiction would be a good form to use to try and waken in people a sense of longing ultimately a longing for heaven. When he wrote The Great Divorce, the literary form he picked was what we would call satire manque. Now satire always looks uh, at the foibles of a society and the hypocrisies and so on. But usually the satirist does it as if they're above the fray. But a satire manque is a satire that turns onto the author too. And it reminds us that the author realizes he or she is also included in these foibles. And, and Lewis would never write, I think, condescendingly or arrogantly. I think he would always see himself as part of the fray. And in fact, we get that in The Great Divorce, and I'll explain it later how. The other thing, too, is that Lewis was a, a fan of embellishment. When he wrote about medieval literature, he said, all the medieval authors took old stories and embellished them. We, we still do it today. You know, you, 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 get, you get movies, for example, like August Rush. It's the retelling of Oliver Twist. You get um, uh, <clears throat> uh, Bridget Jones' Diary. There's a retelling of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. You get Inception. It's just a retelling of the, of the myth of uh, Orpheus and Euryphus. Uh, you get the... Um, uh, My Fair Lady, it's a retelling of Pygmalion, and so on. We, we still do this. Even The Lion King is a retelling of, of um, Hamlet. Lewis himself does this. He writes Till We Have Faces. It's a retelling of the myth of Cupid and Psyche. He writes uh, 
uh, Prince Caspian. It's also kind of a retelling, or at least using the motifs that are in evidence in Hamlet. And, and, and so here's Lewis now writing and embellishing some things. So William Blake had written a poem called The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. And Lewis says, whatever that great poet wanted to do with that, I wanted to write about the divorce between heaven and hell. So he's responding to literature that's come before him. Not only that, as he picks out a literary form, while he uses satire and monkey, he also embellishes in some ways some of the approach that we pick up in the more serious work by Dante called the Divine Comedy. In the Divine Comedy, you have Dante finding himself as a character. Virgil, who wrote about the longing for home, uh, ends up guiding Dante and guiding him through the Inferno, guiding him th partway through the uh, Purgatorio, and guiding him in uh, to, to the place where uh, Beatrice comes out of heaven and collects him, and she guides him into the Paradiso and to the threshold of the vision of God. And Lewis has that sort of motif. He's in hell. And he ends up on a bus. I'll talk more about this in a moment. And he has the opportunity to perhaps make some good choices and end up in heaven if he will let go of the things he's holding in God's place and open his heart and embrace his God. George MacDonald, who is an author who influenced him dramatically as Virgil had influenced Dante, George MacDonald becomes his guide through uh, this, this uh, uh, time on the threshold of heaven, almost a purgatorial thing. So you've got him in hell on the threshold of heaven and the possibility of going higher up, further up and further in, as Lewis would say. So those are the embellishments. So we've looked at longing for a form, embellishments, and now we look at Lewis's rhetorical method. Every time Lewis puts pen to paper, in some ways we get the idea that he's trying to persuade us about something. Uh, and all rhetoric is persuasion. Um, it's audience-centered. It's trying to say things in a way that could describe so that the audience would come in to our perspective maybe make choices that would be influenced then by what we have to say or whatnot. Um, there's a book by Plato called The Gorgias. And in The Gorgias, basically, uh, there's a question. Um, how do you persuade justly? A persuasive person could be a manipulator. And so justice becomes an important part of the thing. And I, I would suggest you, we pick up some awareness of these realities in Lewis and the way he persuades is basically not getting face to face or in the face of his reader, but getting shoulder to shoulder with his reader and defining and describing and describing with such clarity that we find ourselves being able to make the judgments and the conclusions and enter into then a wider understanding, the understanding that the author wants us uh, to, to get. There's a place when George MacDonald comes into the book, and when George MacDonald comes into the book, now you've got dialogue going on between Lewis and MacDonald. And of course, that begins to refine and understanding as well. But it's not instructive. It's something we pick up in the dialogue. And furthermore, uh, he doesn't instruct until the very end. He does make some conclusions that helps us tie things together, and we'll get to those in a bit. Also, Lewis explores theological themes. Uh, you, you shouldn't judge his theology, however, by his fiction. Uh, people may take liberties in their fiction, and also when we're talking about things like theology or even philosophy, sometimes we use fiction because we're trying to extend our understanding into realms where we haven't quite got full grasp. And it seems to me, even as Lewis says in, in the book, he has George MacDonald, one of the main characters in the book, make this judgment. You cannot know eternal reality by definition. You cannot know eternal reality by definition. The word definition literally means of the finite. We define things by them being small enough that we can wrap words around them and other things. Consequently, that's great. But how then do you enter into theological discussion where you want to talk about God who breaks the category of definition? He's infinite. Even Jesus, when he wants to speak about the kingdom of heaven, 
He uses an imaginative approach. The kingdom of heaven is like, and he uses parables and similes, metaphors, figures of speech. And I think Lewis is doing that for us. He's trying to get shoulder to shoulder with us and describe this world, the world of a great divorce, in a way that we can begin to tease out some theological thinking. I don't think Lewis is cracking the whip and trying to goad us into accepting this sort of theological supposal or depiction. But I do think that there are some things that we grasp, not always with the eye, empirically, but some things we grasp with the imaginative eye. We see it in our mind. We, we catch it like you might catch an aroma or a flavor more than a finely defined thing. Even Jesus will say, and the scriptures will say, taste and see that the Lord is good. Enter into the experience of this. And I think Lewis is doing some of this here. Um, so anyway, I'd also have to say there's no intellectual development without the use of the imagination. Even the scientist begins the method with a hypothesis. What is that? It's an imaginative supposal. Suppose it's something like this. And then they begin to test it. If they find their test is true and they want to explain it to other scientists so they could enter into the study, they usually explain it with what they call models. The models are not the thing itself. It's an imaginative depiction. But Lewis made, made the statement once, I want God, not my idea of God. I want my neighbor, not my idea of my neighbor. I want myself, not my idea of myself. I think because we are complex because God is complex. It's always good to engage in this kind of imaginative development. And The Great Divorce is a book that helps us do that. Now for the setting of the book. The story begins where Lewis finds himself in hell. And he says right from the beginning, I never met anyone there. This should never surprise us as Christians, especially as we understand the definitions of sin that are given in Scripture. Uh, sin is man playing God of his own life. In the garden, the serpent tempts Eve by saying, in the day you eat of this fruit, you will be like God. Uh, we see in the fall of Satan, in Ezekiel 28, I will be like the Most High, Isaiah 14, I will be like the Most High. Um, it says in the scriptures too, um, in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned, the Greek word for sin is the word hamartia, the doctrine of sin is called homardiology from the Greek word. And it was an archer's term. It meant to miss the mark. The archer takes his arrow from the quiver, knocks it in the bow, shoots it. If it falls short of the, of the mark, it was a homartia. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What was the mark we fell short of? All of us have tried to play God of our own life. And the consequence of that is that we've fallen far short of the mark. Later, we read even in 1 John, sin is lawlessness. It's not antinomian. Namos is the Greek word for law. It's not against God's law, antinomian. It's anamos. It's without God's law. We are anarchistic. Well, anarchists make bad community, people. And Lewis gives us the flavor of this right at the beginning. I never met anybody in hell. While he's walking along, he sees that he's in the city, and, and everything, the glass on the factory windows is broken. Everything's broken down. Nothing seems to be working. And he doesn't see anybody. But finally, he comes to a bus stop. And lo and behold, there's a queue there. Well, Brits, if they see a queue, they got to line up, right? And a fight breaks out in the, in the queue. And a couple people go rolling off. So Lewis says, well, this is my lucky day. I'm already up two, two paces. Finally, a bus pulls up and they board the bus. He knows not where. And on the bus ride, he finds himself sitting next to different people, and discussions break out. And, and, and then all of a sudden, all these people he discusses with, they all feel like they've been victims of some sort of atrocity. Uh, they've been misunderstood. They haven't had their just uh, experience in life. Life has been unfair to them. And then a fight breaks out on the bus. And the next thing he knows, after the jumble, he's sitting next to somebody else. And then he hears the same sort of complaining. <clears throat> One guy, he starts to talk to him about the city they've come from, hell. And he said, there were two guys that heard that Napoleon was there. And they went to see Napoleon, and Napoleon was two million miles out. And, and, and Lewis says, what, what, what was he saying? 
They said he was just pacing back and forth saying, it was Nay's fault. It was Josephine's fault. It was Wellington's fault. Just blame, blaming other people. But remember that picture, though, because here's a Brit, and who's the worst uh, sinner in, in the Brit's hell? It would be Napoleon two million miles out. There's something humorous about that. But nevertheless, I want you to remember Napoleon's two million miles out. When we get to the end of the book, there's going to be a surprise. So after talking about these people, Lewis is just describing their conversation again, describing so that we as readers hear this and we, we make the judgment. He's not telling us to judge that these people are despicable, but we're judging. These people are despicable people. And then all of a sudden, the bus comes to the threshold of the light of heaven. And as the light comes in the windows, Lewis looks down the aisle of the bus and at the mirror at the front of the bus, he sees his own face. There's the satire monk. He is one of those despicable people on the bus. That motif of the mirror Lewis uses often in his literature in a book he wrote before he was a Christian called Dimer. I've actually got a book coming out about Dimer in October with InterVarsity. <clears throat> I think it's an important book. He wasn't a Christian, but a lot of the, the big questions were already awakening in him in that book. But Dimer comes into this castle and he has all these um, uh, inflated understandings of himself and then all of a sudden he comes into this room and he sees somebody and he's afraid and then he realizes it's his own image. When Eustace becomes a dragon in The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, he has this moment where he looks into the pond and he discovers the truth about himself. This concept of the mirror. You've got to rule until we have basis where she has to come to the moment where she sees herself as she really is. And Lewis invites us as readers to see among these despicable people, we find ourselves too. We have need for grace. We come to the threshold of heaven now, and we're going to be, it's going to be explained to us. What are the issues that are going on in each of our souls? Well, anyway, upon arrival, he begins to see, especially through the light of heaven, that everybody on the bus is a mere shade. The light goes right through them. They're, they're basically ghosts. And not only that, they have no substance. So when they step out of the bus onto the grass of that land, the grass won't even bend beneath their feet. It's like walking on a bed of nails. One of the, one of the ghosts goes to, to pick a flower, but the stem of the daisy is as hard as diamond. And they, they worry if it starts to rain, feel like machine gun bullets coming down from the sky. They were transparent. They were, as Lewis says, man-shaped stains on the brightness of that air. And, and then they also discovered there are people coming out of heaven now to greet them. And every one of the ghosts on the bus has somebody coming out of heaven to begin to confront them on the thing that they're holding on to in God's place and to invite them to let go. And out of that letting go, receive the grace that is offered to them in Christ that they might enter into heaven. Now, Lewis isn't really trying to say this is what goes on theologically and after we die, this is all going to happen. He's writing for people who are alive now, who are facing these issues now, but he's depicting them in this imaginative way. Uh, before considering a sampling of these encounters, I must point out one key concept of the book. There are several big, big ideas, but one key concept. Each ghost lives in denial of reality. Each ghost is in some way very self-referential. Uh, Williams, Charles Williams, C.S. Lewis's friend and fellow inkling with J.R.R. Tolkien, Neville Cockhill, uh, Warren Lewis, and so on. Williams once wrote, hell is a funnel, but heaven is a rose. Hell funnels down to self. It's focused on self. Heaven is a rose like a bud that opens up to a wider, wider world. And so too, each of these ghosts living in denial of reality funnels into self. Um, I, I'll read you some examples. Um, uh, in, on page 58 in my edition, um, friends said the spirit, would, could you only for a moment fix your mind on something not yourself? Uh, the spirit to the well-dressed woman speaks, 
there's a well-dressed ghost a woman who's always hiding behind bushes because she doesn't want anybody to see her the way she is. And she's very vain and she's worried what others will think of her. And it's in that condition. He says, could you not for a moment just fix your mind on something, not yourself? There's a garrulous old woman who has gotten to the habit of grumbling all the time. And, 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 and Lewis says, what, what, what's the matter with her? She's just a grumbler. You know, come on, let bygones be bygones, let her in. And George MacDonald's character speaks to Lewis, the one who comes out of heaven to guide him. The question, he says, is whether she is a grumbler or only a grumble. Has the bad behavior become so large in her that it is destroyed and funneled down the self so the self is dissipated, and all she is is this bad behavior. And Lewis writes of her, if it took her mind a moment off herself, there might in that moment be a chance. So here again is this idea of funneling down the self. And then Lewis writes, for the damned soul is nearly nothing. It is shrunk, shut up in itself. Good beats upon the damned incessantly as sound waves beat on the ears of the deaf but they cannot receive it. Their fists are clenched, their teeth are clenched, their eyes fast shut. First they will not, in the end they cannot open their hands for gifts, or their mouths for food, or their eyes to see. In his experiment criticism, Lewis talks about readers who could be this way. So there's two kinds of readers. There's a user who uses the books only for themselves. They have no interest in, 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 in enjoying the book as a thing in itself they want to use it and then there are receivers who enter into the world of the book and their lives are enriched in the epilogue of experiment criticism Lewis says in coming to understand anything we must reject the facts as they are for us in favor of the facts as they are let me say that again in coming to understand anything we must reject the facts as they are for us in favor of the facts as they are Later in the epilogue, Lewis says, my own eyes are not enough for me. I would see what others have seen. I would read what they've written. Even that's not enough for me. I would read what they've imagined. Even that's not enough for me. I regret that the brutes cannot write books. Gladly would I see how the world presents itself to the eye of a mouse or a bee, or how it comes charged to the olfactory sense of a dog. So these people that are in hell are so self-referential, they can't break out and see the world and encounter the world as it is, and be enlarged by it. It's a big idea in Lewis, and it reverberates throughout his work. In a lecture he gave to his students at Oxford University, it's in the book Rehabilitations, Lewis says to his students, we have fulfilled our whole duty to you if we can help you see some given tract of reality, to see that there's a world outside of yourself, you can begin to accommodate yourself to that world. And somehow, in stretching out, you begin to really grow. All of Lewis's literary critical concerns are addressing those literary critics who turn all of their interests on themselves and never really concentrate on the book that's been written. All of Lewis's evil characters are self-referential. They're utilitarian. This is true. And then Lewis writes in The Great Divorce, there's always something these ghosts prefer to joy, that is, to reality. This is fascinating. Well, let's just look at a selection of some of these ghosts. You, you can read the book quickly enough. I just want to look at a few that will give you a sample of the kinds of things that Lewis is doing. Um, there's one ghost. He's a big, burly guy. Lewis encounters him on the bus on the way up to, to heaven. And he's a big shop foreman. Uh, his representative who comes out of him to greet him was a former worker with him, one of his employees who had become a murderer. He murdered somebody else at the plant. And, and, and so this big shop foreman says, why, do, why did they send you to me? I deserve better than you. And what are you even doing here in heaven? The, the, the murderer says, I, I was wrong. I did egregious, horrible things. And there's such humility, and he repented, and he received grace. And they send him to the shopkeeper, and the shopkeeper says, uh, he's angry. He says, I, I should have had somebody better sent to me. And he keeps saying, I deserve my rights. I deserve my, 
five times in the dialogue, he keeps asserting his rights and his right to get something better. And he sees himself, I'm better than you. How come you're here and I'm not? And he sees himself better than everybody. Why should I be below a bloody murderer like you? There's no humility in him, unlike the murderer. I only want what's coming to me, he says. There's one place in the dialogue too where he says, I'll be damned. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> Lewis uses the, the, the language literally. And in fact, he's, he's under damnation because he's unresponsive. He says, I'm not going to ask for any bleeding charity. And the, 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 the angel that's come out of heaven is talking to him, the former murderer says, then do it once. Ask for the bleeding charity. It's here. It's offered for free. Ask for it. And then he says, I, I was a decent man. I don't need that stuff. I just want my rights. And finally, the, the, the ghost says to him, I, I mean, the angel coming out of heaven that says to him, you know what? You weren't a decent man. Everybody that worked for you hated you. You were abusive. You were terrible and so on. What we discover with this particular ghost and elements of this also percolate in the other, in the other ghosts that have gotten off the bus is we discover in him an example of what is called acrasia. If you read Aristotle's rhetoric, he talks about the fact that we, we make choices. And if we make a morally bad choice, we come to a mystical moment, basically. We could either repent of that. Aristotle doesn't use the word repent, but we could either repent, uh, let go of it, acknowledge that we did wrong, and, and, and get back on track again. Or else, if we persist in the behavior, we will begin to rationalize it and justify it. And Aristotle uses the word akrasia or akrasia. In Greek, it means to be without command of my moral life. If I persist in rationalizing bad behavior, I come to the place where I can't even see anymore that which is right or that which is wrong. Lewis puts it this way in his book, A Preface to Paradise Lost, continued disobedience to conscience makes conscience blind. Let me say it again. Continued disobedience to conscience makes conscience blind. And this particular ghost is one of those kind. Uh, another ghost, interestingly enough, is a theologian ghost. Now, Lewis has said in another book, uh, Reflection on the Psalms, the worst of all bad men are religious bad men. The quicker I might be willing to uh, die for my faith, maybe the quicker I'd be willing to kill for my faith or painted thus saith the Lord across my own opinions. And this particular theologian is also a bishop. Interestingly enough, he's not a rigid, uh, 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 my way is Yahweh kind of theologian. He's more of a theologian who's basically lost his core beliefs and yet persists in sort of a pseudo-spirituality. It's kind of swarmy and so on. His heaven representative who comes to meet him was a former seminary friend of his named Dick. The bishop chides Dick for his narrowness. He even says, why you were coming to believe in a literal heaven and hell. And Dick says to the bishop, wasn't I right? The bishop says, heavens, no. And, and Dick says, where do you imagine you have been? He just came up from hell on the bus. The bishop says, oh, you mean that gray town with its continual hope of mourning? We must all live by hope, must we not, he says, with its field for indefinite progress is, in a sense, heaven. If only we have eyes to see it. That's the beautiful idea. So basically, the bishop has taken the reality, again, denying reality, he takes the reality and repaints it in its exact opposite tries to make hell seem like heaven. And he's tried to do that theologically too. He denies Christ and then tries to say, but the redemptive way is to follow whatever sort of swarmy thing he wants to offer. He calls hell heaven. It's indicative of the way the bishop has flip-flopped in all of his theological thinking. He says he merely championed his honest opinions and followed them fearlessly. He praises himself for his courage. When the doctrine of the resurrection ceased to commend itself to the critical faculties which God has given me, he said, I openly rejected it. 
I preached my famous sermon against the resurrection. I took every risk. Well, you can see how he begins to paint some sort of pseudo-spirituality over this. <laughs> he rejects the resurrection, but God in history and time and in scripture has given us the message of the resurrection. And he says, well, God gave me a critical faculties, and with my critical faculties, I just rejected all that. Well, why would he accept? Uh, it's, it's, all, it's all basically uh, belief that, 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 that is subpar. You know, we'll accept something and not accept the other. If we don't accept this, why don't we accept this? If we do accept this, why don't we accept this? And, and so consequently, the bishop is picking and choosing, and he becomes self-referential in his approach, and consequently, he, he, he's his own God, once again, expressed in a different way. And he praises himself for his risk-taking. So Dick, his former seminary friend, who is kind of drifting in that place, and finally comes to real faith, Dick says, truly, you took no risk. Your book sales increased when you became controversial. You became more popular. Your speaking invitations came rolling in, and you were even given a bisprick. So Lewis is really doing some tongue-in-cheek things about the church when he shows that the church might give bisprics to, to people who are heretics or apostles. Dick says, you, were, you didn't hold honest opinions. They wrote, uh, he said, we wrote the papers in seminary that got the best marks. We won applause. In, in essence, Dick says, we catered to the inner ring. Now, the concept of the inner ring is huge in Lewis. Um, the inner ring is when you will compromise your moral proclivities to enter into a group of people you want to be a part of. And this priest has done this. Lewis writes about it in an essay called The Inner Ring. He writes about it in a, in a book called the, uh, uh, That Hideous Strength. And even his essay on Rudyard Kipling, he says of Kipling, it's, a, it's the sharpest criticism Lewis writes on everybody, anybody. He thinks Kipling was a technically excellent poet, but he said he was the poet of the inner ring. It's always these guys who are on the end side, uh, roughing up other people, the neophytes who are trying to get in. And Dick says to the, the, to the bishop, repent and believe. Reality is harsh to the feet of shadows. You need to hear these things and respond to them. Um, he's also, uh, the, the, the bishop also has a matter of pride. After so many compromises, how can he find the humility to acknowledge his wrong? There's an interesting poem that was written by an American naval officer as his ship was pulling out of Shanghai Harbor when Shanghai was in flames and being taken over. And he wrote this, tonight Shanghai is burning and I am dying too. But there's no death more certain than death inside of you. Some men die of shrapnel while others go down in flames. But most men die inch by inch while playing at little games. And this bishop is one of those who has let the compromises finally eat up any kind of substantive reality to any kind of theological belief. And the bishop's last criticism, this is, this, again, this is Lewis at his humorous best. He says that um, he's concerned about heaven because it's got finality, so therefore, He's absolutely clueless. And then he said, we've got to travel hopefully, and to travel hopefully is better than to arrive. And so he refuses to go into heaven. And he says to Dick, I, I, I've actually got a little theological society down in hell. And I know they're not as sharp as we were when we were younger, but it's a group that needs me uh, because he thinks he can bring the insight that they all need. And he says, so I, I've got to return because I've got to read a paper to a theological society in hell. I remember a theologian uh, professor of mine in grad school, he thought that was one of the most hilarious sections in any Lewis book he ever read. The theologian who returns to hell to read a paper of the theological study. Um, later, Lewis will add other things that might bring some perspective too to this, this, uh, to this bishop. At Milton, he quotes Milton who in, in uh, Paradise Lost, when Satan first comes on the scene, Milton uh, has Satan say, better to reign in hell and serve in heaven. And that, that, just, that just shows you the nonsense of this stuff. Um, now we come to uh, 
Another ghost, um, actually I want to look at two different ghosts who fall under a similar category. Uh, and these are examples of what Lewis calls in the four loves, need love. They have the need to be needed. And actually they have the need to project themselves on other people so that other people will become dependent upon them. They're not giving liberty to people. They are imprisoning people. Uh, Lewis writes about this sort of thing in the four loves. He, I think, or rule becomes this way in, in uh, till we have faces. But this is an early expression of it in these two particular ghosts in the Great Divorce, who are on the scene even before Lewis does these other depictions in the later books. The first one is the controlling wife ghost who had been married to poor Robert. Uh, she complains of all she had to endure being married to him. I had to drive him every step of the way. He had no drive himself. I had to nag him to take on all that extra work. He needed a better house because how else would he invite uh, important people into his life if he didn't have a bigger and better house? He needed to work more. He needed to get that money. He didn't have time for recreation. He needed to do these things. And he never really appreciated all the entertaining I did to try and push him forward and let him meet the right people. As a matter of fact, he had some friends. But these friends were not good for him. He would never go further along with those friends. They would only keep him from success. And then the wife says, every useful friend he ever made was due to me. She didn't see friends as people who could enliven and enlighten one's life, but if they had value, if they were useful. I did my duty to the very end, she said. She thought he was getting lazy and fat and so I forced him to take exercise, she says, and in a very Lewisian way, she says, that was really my chief reason for keeping a great Dane. Can you imagine how the great Dane was keeping this guy active and walking? She wells up though at the end, after giving all this great play about herself, and she's totally blind to the people she's hurt, and especially her husband. She says, he's not fit to be on his own, Put me in charge of him. He wants firm handling. I know him better than you do. Give him to me, do you hear? Just give him to me. I'm his wife, aren't I? I was only beginning. There's, there's lots, lots, lots of things I still want to do with him. No, Hilda, listen, please, please. I'm so miserable. I must have someone to, to do things to. And this controlling self-interest has consumed her to her own eternal peril. A, a similar ghost in this need to be needed uh, category. And again, if you read the four loves, you'll see the, this, this uh, described and now here in the great divorce depicted. There was a ghost who had been Michael's mother. She gets off the bus and she's expecting her son to come to her because certainly he needed her and her son doesn't come. Another guy named Reginald comes. She demands to see Michael and is told she can see him as soon as she thickens up enough so that he could see her. She doesn't realize how she is so diminished by her self-referentialism and her utility that she's almost become invisible. He's, Reginald says, you will become solid enough for Michael to perceive you when you learn to want something else besides Michael. Lewis writes an essay about this too. It's called First and Second Things. You'll find it in God and the Dog. If you put second things first, you lose out on first and second things. But you put first things first, put God first. And all of a sudden you have the capacity to enjoy second things for what they can give you and you won't be using them as substitutes for God himself. You cannot treat God as a means to Michael, Reginald says. You must want God for his own sake. She reacts to this. You wouldn't talk like that if you were a mother. And Reginald says, you mean if I were only a mother. But there is no such thing as being only a mother. You exist as Michael's mother only because you first exist as God's creature. And again, he's emphasizing priority. Human beings can't make one another really happy, Reginald says. You cannot love a fellow creature fully till you love God. He then goes on to say, natural feelings are holy when God's hand is on the rain, and they all go bad when they set up on their own 
and make themselves false gods. And the four loves, eight times in that book, Lewis says, love becomes a demon when it becomes a god. When love becomes a god, it becomes a demon. He also writes, when the means become autonomous, they're dangerous. When some means you have is untethered from principle and isn't moving towards its proper end, it exists on its own. And again, because there's no principle and no end, it's very self-referential. And we play God of those situations. and We become controlling, accordingly self-interested. Well, Michael's mother cries out, I believe in a God of love. But for her, love is giving her her own way. She doesn't understand love in the context of the wider world where there are other people who, whose needs need to be truly considered, not just her needs. I want my boy, she says, and I mean to have him. He's mine, do you understand? Mine, 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 forever and ever. She would prefer, at the end of the day, to have her son with her in hell as part of her misery than have him in heaven and, and, and happy. She the the, the dam damnable nature of this hoarding self-interest. Lewis is depicting these things, and again, if we look deeply in these characters, we find ourselves at the end of the day sitting on the bus, looking down the way, and we see our own face in the mirror. I think Lewis does an incredible job of depicting things that cause us to have carved out of us some things maybe we've even heard ourselves say at different times. Now, the, the, one of the most interesting ghosts to me is a ghost who comes on the scene and he has a red lizard on his shoulder. Lewis said he was kind of smoky, oily looking, and he's got this lizard, and the lizard's talking in his ear. And all of a sudden, this burning angel comes out of heaven and says to the ghost, off so soon? The ghost says, well, it's a nice place. I know it's a nice place, but it's really, it's, it's not this, this person here. He just doesn't doesn't quite fit in here. Well, we find out from Lewis later that the lizard represents lust. So the angel says, oh, I can take care of him. Let me kill him. And the ghost says, well, wait a minute. I didn't ask for anything quite so drastic as that. Well, you said he didn't fit in, and you said you liked the place. I can kill him. Let me just kill him. I'll take care of him. Well, it, it might hurt me. It might hurt me. I didn't say it wouldn't hurt you. But I said it will benefit you. Let me kill him. Oh, no, no. Oh, you think I'm a coward, don't you? Well, listen, I, it sounds like a bad operation. Let me go back down on the next bus and see if I can't get a second opinion. And I'll come back tomorrow. And the ghost says, there is no other time. All moments are contained in this moment. Let me kill him. Oh, so you think I'm a coward, huh? And the lizard starts talking into his ear and says, he can do it. He can kill me. But if he killed me, you wouldn't have me anymore to give you all those dreams and all those thoughts and all those longings and so on. Just, but this lizard has made him miserable. He doesn't want this anymore. He hasn't wanted to let go of it, but he's stuck in a conundrum. And finally, he says to the angel, you know what? I don't care if it hurts me. I'm weary. Kill it. And the angel reaches with his burning hot hand and grabs that lizard. And the lizard begins to writhe and bite and so on. And the ghost falls to the ground screaming. And the angel throws the lizard down and breaks his back. And as Lewis describes the scene, he says, all of a sudden I noticed that that ghost started turning solid and real. And an arm came up and another arm came up and he became a giant man. Moose said, I saw something else too, that the lizard started to change. And it actually ends up coming up as a giant stallion, so strong. And where the ghosts could not uh, step or crush the grass beneath their feet, Stallion starts pounding its hooves. The man steps and the ground shakes. And all of a sudden, we see that the angel has given the man back his sexuality, but not in a perverted form. And consequently, the, the man now falls at his knees, 
bows to the angel. And Lewis says, I saw the tears in his eyes. And then he goes over and rubs his nose in the nose of the stallion and mounts the stallion and goes riding off into heaven. Huge difference. The lizard had been riding the man. And his sexuality was out of control. He's given it back bigger and stronger than ever, but this man now rides the stallion and is in control. Now, Lewis understands that we're amphibious creatures. We're people of the spirit and people of the flesh. And Lewis has one of the healthiest models of this, I think. I, I remember years ago, a student came to me and he knocked on my door at my office and I, I, I the door. He was one of my advisees. I hadn't seen him that whole semester. But I opened the door and he looked very disheveled. I said, you don't look very well. He says, I'm not. I'm not. I, 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 I have been um, seeing a psychiatrist. I'm seeing a psychologist. I'm taking antidepressants. I just want to come by and see you. I said, sit down. What's the story? He says, it's lust. He said, I'm consumed by lust. It's destroying my soul. I said, well, tell me about it. I knew this kid, and I didn't think that he was a predatory person. I said, describe for me this lust. What he described for me is what I would call normative sexual desire for a horny 20-year-old college guy. I said, you didn't describe lust for me. You described sexual desire. Lust is not, uh, uh, sexual desire is not lust. Um, sexual desire isn't lust any more than hunger is gluttony. And I think that's a fair analogy. I said, lust is predatory. Lust does something to try and make it happen. Matter of fact, the word epithumia in the Greek for lust, Jesus uses it about himself. He says, I lust to celebrate this Passover with you. I desire. It's in Luke twenty-two fifteen. 15. He uses a word about himself. Then what does he do? Tells the disciples, go make it happen. Paul says, I lust. He says, to live is Christ, to die is gain. I desire to depart and be with Christ. I lust. And he says, and I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to finish well. So lust is taking the step towards making it happen. Lust isn't to notice that somebody's sexually attractive. And lust does not mean you suppress sexual desire. Uh, uh, excuse me. Yeah. Instead, what we should do is we should learn to control our desire with virtue, uh, under Christ, and, and like this man, learn to put a bit and bridle on this part of our lives rather than let it control us. Um, I said to this young man, are you a sexual person? He didn't even know how to answer that. I said, where did you get this idea that to have sexual desire was wrong? And he had heard a sermon from a well-meaning preacher who preached out of the Sermon on the Mount. You know, if you look at a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery. That's, 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 it's like if you just notice the person, that's not what he's saying. Jesus is saying, if you look at a woman to lust after her, you're trying to take steps to make it happen. It's very different. It would, it would almost be as if uh, if you notice somebody had a, a red hat on, something was wrong with you. Well, you notice the person has red hat, it's no big deal. But you move on. You, you, you don't go there. And Lewis, I think, shows that virtue is a way to put bit and bridle on these things, and we need grace. And the only one of the ghosts who ends up in heaven is his wife. Um, and Lewis says that the sexual sins or the sins of the body are not the worst sins. And the reason why is because the worst sinner of all time didn't even have a body. That was Satan. And so consequently, Lewis says the, of the soul, the sins of the spirit, pride, envy, and so on. doesn't mean that the sins of the flesh couldn't become that. Because as soon as I engage in the sins of flesh, then I move to that acrasia again. I begin to rationalize it. I get envious. I get proud. They are the threshold to all those other worst sins. So keep that in mind. And then the last one that I wanted to point out quickly is that there's this woman, Sarah Smith of Golders Green. She comes on the scene. She's glorious, magnificent. She comes out of heaven. And she goes to meet this, this tragedy and actor who's swollen and big, and as Lewis describes it, he says, amazed, but there was a string from the tragedian that went down to a little dwarf. And when Sarah Smith comes, she doesn't address the tragedian, she dresses the dwarf. And the dwarf is her husband, Frank. And, and the, 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 um, the tragedian is sort of like this alter ego um, 
that Frank plays pathos for all it's worth. Everything is about his hurt feelings. Everything is about his need. The whole world has to compromise to what his issues are. And Sarah Smith's trying to talk him into letting go of this stuff. He doesn't need it anymore. He can come into heaven. There's a moment where she starts to break through and he gets a little bigger, but then he just shuts himself off and he diminishes and diminishes and diminishes till he becomes so small that at the end of that string, the string is wafting in the air and he's not even substantive enough to hold the string on his false pretense and alter ego. And Lewis, Lewis's character talks to George MacDonald about it. I, I don't get this. I don't understand it. And, 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 and MacDonald says the amazing thing about hell is that it's practically nothing at all. He says, as a matter of fact, you choose against God and you choose against that which makes you real. You choose against that which makes you substantive. You become diminished and you become able to fit into hell. And then McDonald says, when you took that bus ride for two days from hell, you weren't going anywhere. You were just moving from your diminutive state into something big enough so that you could even come into the threshold of hell. And then McDonald says, as a matter of fact, hell is no bigger than that grain of sand over there in your world. And he says, in this world, hell is no bigger than an atom. So that if a butterfly were to swallow it, the butterfly wouldn't even have any kind of irritation. Now go back to Napoleon, who was two million miles out in that hell. And all of a sudden we get Lewis's concept of hell. And it's powerful. It's very, very powerful. It's interesting that Lewis at the end then has George MacDonald sort of summarize things. And he says, there's two kinds of pity. There's a pity of action where our heart breaks for somebody. And we engage in empathy towards that person. And we seek to alleviate the pain of that person. But he said there's another kind of pity, and it's the passion of pity. And the passion of pity is self-pity. And it becomes manipulative. Lewis talks about it as the cunning tears of hell that get us to compromise any kind of principle. It's the pity that can be used the wrong way around. It can be used for a kind of blackmailing. And he says, heaven has no room for it. So some people say, isn't it bad that one person going to hell would be enough to create sorrow for all of heaven? And George MacDonald's character says, no. No, heaven, it's sad. Sad for them that this other person has chosen hell over heaven. But it says they can never steal our joy. This is interesting in our day, particularly. Christians have the truth in Scripture. And sometimes we mess up in our interpretation. I believe the Bible is an errant in the original autographs. I trust it. I believe it's authoritative. But I, I don't extend the doctrine of inerrancy to the post-interpreted text, only to the pre-interpreted text. And sometimes we make mistakes in our interpretation. I get that. But, but we have a very clear sense of what the scriptures are saying. And even people who don't agree with some texts of scripture, I can say, well, well, just read it and tell me on the surface what you think it's saying. And they can describe it quite clearly. But so often if we see a person who has violated scripture and done something morally wrong in their life, because we have a friend who's done this, our tendency to say, wow, they're my friend. And all of a sudden, the pity of passion comes out. And consequently, we cave on the clear teaching of Scripture. And, and it's tragic. And, and, and consequently, it would be better if we had the pity of action that could be empathetic towards our friend who's compromised and seek to alleviate their pain, to be by their side. Jesus never said to the woman caught in adultery, hey, I understand, you know, I think I'm going to compromise a little on this adultery teaching now because I know you and I feel sad, so we're just going to let bygones be bygones and we'll throw this out. No. He comes to her. He loves her. He forgives her. He says, go your way and sin no more. We should love the people who are struggling like we would want to be loved in the times when we struggle. 
but we don't want the truth compromised in the process. And so Lewis makes this big point at the end of the book. I think it's powerful. But anyway, we could talk more. There's a lot of really great one-liners throughout the book and so on, but I don't know if we have time for it now because I think maybe I've gone too long. I don't know. Um, so someone wants to know about the many references to animals throughout the book. Is there a symbolic value for the animals that he chooses to use? Well, the, the only one that has a clear symbolic um, depiction that I'm aware of is the lizard transformed into the horse. And, and the value would be the very one that I described. Now, Lewis, Lewis, I will say something quickly about Lewis and animals. Lewis was extremely compassionate towards animals. He, he, um, he wrote anti-vivisection articles. He was opposed to use of animals and experimentation. He wrote in a letter to a friend, you know, my neighbors trap the mice in their houses. I, I try to feed mine. He always had dogs and cats around. He loved animals. As a matter of fact, if you go to his, his uh, books, uh, you look at, at, at the Narnian Chronicles, um, you, Uncle Andrew is an evil character. He's blowing up guinea pigs. He goes from blowing up guinea pigs to try and destroy people, hurt people. You've got the white witch, Jadis, Queen of Charn, who becomes a white witch of Narnia. She beats her horses. She beats her her animals, and she is very cruel, and then tries to destroy people. You've got also in the in the uh, uh, science fiction books, you've got Weston, who's the worst, most heinous of all of Lewis's evil characters. He's eviscerating these these animals on Paralandra. Uh, the Nice National Institute of Coordinated Experiments does experiments on animals, and eventually tries to do experiments on humans. He always depicts his most evil characters as people who treat animals poorly. And I think Lewis gets the idea, describes them this way, we pick up ourselves the judgment, this is a bad person. So anyway, I hope that's helpful a little bit. Um, I think uh, one question, I think the question at the end, he, he asked about the particular animals. So um, is there any significance to the particular, like the, the stallion, for instance? Um, I'm assuming that he chose that particular animal because of its uh, strength and... Well, probably to the contrast. To the lizard. A relatively weak lizard. Yeah. You know, a cold-blooded kind of thing uh -huh. versus this powerful, powerful stallion. Yeah. The contrast is dramatic. I think that's probably more. And I think uh, also what you mentioned, the difference between being ridden by the lizard versus riding the stallion yeah. and the strength. Yeah, that's good. Um, okay. Uh, so someone um, also asks about, says you mentioned earlier, and it seems to be a theme throughout the book, that a victim mentality is evident in everyone who is in hell. How do you think Lewis would respond to the current move toward glorifying or amplifying the idea of victimhood? Um, I, I, I think that what I said at the end about um, the pity of action, which would be empathy and trying to alleviate the pain of others versus self-pity, the pity of passion, would be what he would say about this. And I think he would be appalled at the kinds of things we see going on. And probably the great divorce is his biggest uh, 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 depiction of the kinds of dangers that are involved in these processes. So I, I, I think he would be concerned, and for good reason. We should be concerned too, especially if we see the truth compromised. We may not understand what the truth may be, and we may, it may be fuzzy for us because we have this friend, you see, who has fallen into whatever. But if we want to help that friend, really, we don't help them by compromising truth. We help them by learning the very delicate art of walking the life of truth and love. And usually what we find in our culture is people will be so harsh with the truth that they're not loving or so wishy-washy with love, the truth goes out the window. Maturity would be able to hold these things together. And not intention, but to hold them together in such a way that if we did it well, it would make such sense. And I think that's what Lewis is trying to do. Okay, yeah. Um, so where does the great divorce rank among 
uh, the popularity of the reading audience of Lewis in comparison, say, to Mere Christianity, which uh, everyone seems to read and know, you know, so how does The Great Divorce rank in popularity? I, I think it's up there. I don't think it's as popular as the Narnian books. I don't think it's as popular as Mere Christianity. Um, I don't think it's as popular as the screw tape letters, mm -hmm. but I would put it up there at least on the level of the, uh, of the science fiction books. And this is all totally opinion and mm -hmm. conjecture on my part. But I think when you, you look at the work of Max McLean and the sorts of things he's doing, you know, with the most mm -hmm. recent convert and, and what he did with screw tape letters, he took this particular book because of its theatrical um, uh, value. Mm -hmm. And he's put it on stage and people, it's met with great review. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think it's more popular than maybe we realize. And I think it's up there. And again, if, if somebody says to me, what C.S. Lewis book should I start with? And I talk with them a little bit and they don't really fall in one category or another. I'll say, start with The Great Divorce. Mm -hmm. it's really, it, it really gives you a good introduction to his imaginative mind, to his penetrative and thoughtful analysis of varying mm -hmm questions and so on. So anyway. Yeah, I, um, in asking people, uh, you know, what is your favorite C.S. Lewis book? Um, of course, Mere Christianity often comes, you know, immediate response, screw tape letters. And then I would say, I and mean, again, this is my limited experience, I would say probably third um, most common is The Great Divorce. So I don't know what your experience yeah. has been with that, but yeah, I probably am talking more out of my own my own interest too, because I, I like this book. Yeah. Um, so uh, next question: How does Lewis's um, depiction of the afterlife in the Great Divorce, including the way that uh, people can travel back and forth between heaven and hell, compare to ancient mythologies where people travel through various regions of the afterlife? I, I don't. I don't think Lewis is trying to depict anything particular. I think he's just using it as a motif. I don't think there's anything that is structurally substantive about mm -hmm. about this. Mm -hmm. uh, Lewis. Lewis was a great lover of myths, all kinds of myths. He said. He said he really liked the uh, Greek and Roman myths. He liked the um, the Irish myths more. Mm -hmm. but he liked the Nordic myths most yeah. of all. So a lot of times when Lewis is writing fiction, again, he'll use some, some embellishment. He might take some of these, these mythological features and add them. But I don't think he's even doing this in The Great Divorce. Mm -hmm. I think what he's trying to do is put a motif together where he could have his readers be confronted with the things they might be holding on to in God's mm -hmm. plan. He's trying to get us to let go. And if he's using um, uh, blanks, beg your pardon? if he's... Uh, contrasting with Blake's idea of, you know, heaven and hell kind of two ends of the same stick or whatever. And he's trying to contract, contrast with that and say, no, the two don't meet. Um, they're, they're, you know, they end up in different places. So That's he's, you know, um, that whole Blake, you know, Blake, um, Blake's, um, yeah, the, the, it's interesting because the end of that question too, the person asks, how does Lewis's story relate or compare to the Roman Catholic doctrine of purgatory? I don't think he's doing anything with the Roman Catholic doctrine of purgatory in this particular book. He has a threshold of heaven be something like the purgatorial. But if you want to find out what Lewis thinks about purgatory, you have to read um, letters to Malcolm chiefly on prayer where Lewis says, I believe in purgatory. He said, mind you, not as that Romish doctrine came to be. He didn't believe it was a place of torture. But he did believe, though, that something happens to us. When we die and we end up in heaven, something's got to happen to purge all this garbage that's in us. I got a con I, I was, you have to take this by faith, but I was a football player when I was in college. I had a horrible concussion one time. And I remember crying out to God, please don't let this happen to me. It's my senior year. Everything went immediately clear. And I've often thought if after that, that's a good analogy of what it will be like when we get to heaven. We'll get to heaven and we will realize we've lived our lives relatively concussed. When we get to heaven, it'll be completely clear. But what's going to happen to us to eradicate the, the proclivity to sin? 
where it won't happen. Something supernatural happens. And anybody who believes in the Bible believes in some sort of purgatory because 1 Corinthians 3 says that when we get to heaven, all of us are going to pass through a fire. And the wood, hay, and stubble is going to burn off and the gold and precious jewels and that which is real character will survive. We'll offer it up to God. I don't think it's something that's going to be protracted and long. Something dramatic is going to happen. Lewis even says, if I arrived in heaven and God said to me, welcome, come in. Lewis says, I would ask him, couldn't I be fixed first, Lord? And I think there's something that's going to happen there. I wonder when it says we'll see Jesus, it says his eyes in Revelation are described as a flame of fire. I wonder if one look in that, those eyes, we'll let go of all the baggage we're carrying because none of that will be important to us and we'll look right at him. Maybe it'll just happen in that very second. I don't know, but Lewis at least toys with it a little bit. I think we can too, because we want to try and understand how to interpret that 1 Corinthians 3 passage. And if we do, we may have to do some imaginative thinking, maybe have some good conversations around the fire pit with friends and try and figure it out. So, 60% of the yous in the New Testament are plural. The Bible's written to a community. Seems to me then that the uh, interpretation of the scripture is benefited by the plurality of people discussing texts. So uh, you made a statement uh, somewhere in your presentation, continued disobedience to conscious, I guess. The the statement is this. It's in a preface to Paradise Lost, Uh which is Lewis's literary critical work on Milton's Paradise Lost. It depends on the edition. I have several editions. I've read this book over and over. Some of them, it's on page nine. Some of them, it's on page 11. But it's in the first couple chapters of that book. And the, the, the phrase is, continued disobedience to conscience makes conscience blind. Now, let's make the distinction. You've got conscious, that's to be aware. The opposite is to be unconscious, knocked out. Or you've got conscience, C-O-N-S-C-I-E-N-C-E. Science is the Latin word for knowledge. Con is with. So it's with knowledge, but usually we talk about conscience as moral sight or moral knowledge. So continued disobedience to conscience, my moral sight, makes my moral sight blind. I lose the ability. And I would say, too, the, the, the pity of passion, the excusing my sin, And expecting others to, uh, with that, it's the kind of thing that leads to consciousness being blind. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you described this book as a particular type of satire. Yeah. Uh, Can you restate? I would say satire manque. And the manque, you see, you got satire where the satirist is looking down at the foibles of society, almost like they're above the fray. Monquet has the idea it's kind of broken. So satire Monquet, M-A-N-Q-U-E, it's a French word. And, 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 and so the satire Monquet is a satire where the author never forgets that he or she is part of the mess. And so therefore, we're, we're writing in a less judgmental way. We may, we may not be any less satirical. We may see the foibles, but we're not, we're not trying to... Um, demean and think we're, our, our, our state is not on the table. We're, we're part of the problem. Mm-hmm. Okay. So uh, Daniel wants to know, where is the line drawn and how do we discern the difference between being self-referential and being fully human? Yeah, I see the, I see the way it's written. It's not self-reverential, like I'm revering myself or yeah, worshiping self- myself. Referential. It's self referential Uh so reference right you go to the reference library and you find out about some book reference so if i'm self-referential i am the one spinning my understanding of reality and truth out from myself like a spider Uh spins its web it's all Uh self-oriented it's what lewis calls the poison of subjectivism in the essay that he wrote that way actually i wrote a whole book on this it's called C.S. Lewis and A Problem of Evil. Um, and, and 
the, the problem of evil I'm looking at is this self-reference. Lewis says of subjectivism that it becomes the, the, the way we begin to rationalize all kinds of evil acts in our life. And, and um, so anyway, self-reference. Being fully human <clears throat> is not to be self-referential. We, we, we cannot make sense of ourselves in isolation from God and from others. What does Jesus say when he's asked, what's the greatest commandment? What's the most important thing I could do? He says, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Be in community with God first so you can understand your identity in him. Mm-hmm. And be in community with others around you so that you can begin to understand yourself in that way too. You know, uh, I can think one of the best examples of that in the Bible, I think, is the story in Daniel of Nebuchadnezzar where he goes up on, you know, on the, yeah. and, and looks out and he, he says, says, look at, look at all that I've made. And then the very next pa- uh, verse t- says that he's out in the field like a, an animal. He's lost yeah. his. So, uh, and then as the story goes on, it says he comes to himself. And then as he comes to himself, it says he he magnified the God of heaven. So the story that's developing there is that he loses his distinction as a human being who has the capacity to understand that we're not the center of the universe. He he actually loses his humanity in a certain sense. And it's only when he comes to that realization that there's a God in heaven and he's the sovereign Lord that he gains his senses back and he comes back, you know, and, and he worships the God of heaven. That's an excellent depiction. Very, very good illustration. Well done, Bill. Um, so do you think the great divorce, it, uh, the, the appeal of the great divorce is limited to believers? No, no, I don't think so at all. First off, I'd say just because you're a believer doesn't mean you read books well. <laughs> We, we're, we're people who are, who are goofy. You read, everybody in the Bible could have introduced themselves in some sort of a recovery group. So consequently, uh, we don't always do well, even as believers. So I wouldn't say just because you're a believer, you're going to read a book well. And non-believers can read books, and they can read them relatively objectively. I think we need to understand that that's so. But it's a good story. And if I'm willing to... Uh, enter into the story and read it at face value for what it's saying, I think it could have a great appeal to the Christian and to the Mm non-Christian. We can see ourselves in some ways depicted. It can make us hungry to want to do better. It can make us hungry for grace. So I I, I think it's a book for everybody. Yeah, I think um, I I see uh, considerable insight into human nature, you know, in some of these depictions here. And so I think, you know, it could help anybody gain some, you know, personal insight into motivations and, you know, the outcome of pursuing certain um, ends or goals, you know, that kind of thing. So yeah, I think it would, you know, it has um, a lot to offer to both. Um, When should we and when shouldn't we equate Lewis's fiction to his actual theology? Well, I think we should never equate it to his actual theology, ever. But I think that what we could do is we could say, he's depicting something imaginatively, and we can talk about that. And we could talk about how we would begin to maybe understand theology, and we can maybe disagree with Lewis when he does something in his fiction. That's okay. Mm-hmm. But I think we're saying, by, by being fair to him, he has depicted this situation this way in his fiction. Mm-hmm. What do we think of it? And we say, you know, in some ways, it, it, it sort of runs my understanding. The bandwidth of my grasp is better. I, I, I don't know that I have got a good definition any more than I have a good, solid, final definition when Jesus tells a parable. Mm-hmm. Jesus helps us taste and see. The parable helps us understand. We see with the with the eyes of the heart, not necessarily with the eyes of flesh. And I think we should do that with any kind of imaginative depiction. So you it, see, it would be terrible if you took a parable that Jesus was giving, say, say like the, the parable of the unjust judge, and the woman is pounding on his door because she wants him to answer her at court and, and plead her case. She's pounding and pounding and pounding. 
Finally, the guy says, get away from my door, get away from my door. And Jesus says, he wouldn't get, a, he, he, she didn't get away till he came down. And finally, he came down and took care of her. And Jesus' depiction is, therefore, we should always pray. Well, if you overplay the parable, you've got the unjust judge being God. The parables aren't like that. The, the par parabolic form is to make a singular point. It's not an allegory where everything means something. And so I think you have to understand the use of imaginative language, the use of supposal, the use of parable, the use of, an, of uh, allegory, the use of metaphor, the use of simile. And I think we want to interpret particularly uh, literary concepts with an accurate understanding of the literary form that's being used. Well, uh, so Brian wants to know, could you speak about the mention of pity towards the end and what he intended to draw out by talking about pity? Yeah, well, I think first off, because Lewis is writing this book for us, he wants us to understand that we can become people like Frank the tragedian who could play our victimization out and expect everybody to concede to whatever, whatever difficulties we think we've, we've, we've endured. We may not have endured bad things. We may have just imagined it and, and play it, played that kind of pathos, the pity of pathos, self-pity for all it's worth. So I think Lewis is trying to portray it so that we'll be mindful of that we could be doing these things. But also I think he wants us to be mindful of it so that we don't get taken in by it when somebody else is doing it. I think the best thing we can do is not sell the farm and compromise scripture when somebody's trying to do this, but instead stay engaged with that person, love on that person, and, and, and be as tender as you can with them, be empathetic towards them as you can, but also be engaged in trying to alleviate the pain, and that will mean then that you don't, you don't um, uh, trash or violate the truth of Scripture. I think we have to have we have to walk in truth and love. You can read the end of The Great Divorce. It would be interesting to read. It's in the last couple chapters. And read it yourself and see what you think he's saying. Okay, so, so Andy <clears throat> asked, um, to what degree does Lewis's message in The Great Divorce reveal how he believes more in spiritual, ontological, or metaphysical transformation instead of centering things primarily on believing a set of doctrines? Well, I think that the, the, the contrast between spiritual, ontological, or metaphysical transformation and doctrines, um, that contrast is an artificial one. I don't think those things have to be in contrast. Mm -hmm. I think it's possible, just like we could say, I believe in truth and love, we could come down more on love than on truth, or more on truth than on love. love. We become wishy-washy when we come down on love without truth. We should hold those things together. I think doctrine, doctrine just simply means teaching. And, and we should have good teaching. We should try as best we can to grasp and understand as best we might. And if we understand well, those teachings should be transformational. And they should be deeply transformational, not, not just intellectually transformational, but transformational to my soul, mm -hmm. my emotional life, my relationships with others, and so on. So I don't think the contrast has to be there. If it is there, then... And, and, and we're picking that up from somebody. Maybe we can engage in dialogue and, with them. They won't make those artificial contrasts. So it's, it seems like what you're saying is Lewis thought of, about those as um, uh, not separate, but uh, ideally um, unified uh, so that the truth of doctrine or whatever has as its goal transformation. Um, I'm thinking like in the preface where he says, quote, um, I beg readers to remember that this is a fantasy. It has, of course, or I intended it to have a moral. It has, uh, um, but the trans mortal conditions are solely an imaginative supposal. They are not even a guess or speculation at what may actually await us. The last thing I wish is to arouse factual curiosity about the details of the afterworld. Yeah. So it seems like what he's saying there is uh, the transformation, the moral transformation that he's trying to depict there. He's using the fiction in order to emphasize that, you know, the moral transformation, but he's not trying to say 
that it's in the depiction, in the fictional depiction that you are, you know, the truth of that doctrine is um, realized. But, but Lewis, Lewis would never trash uh, good doctrine either, sound doctrine. Yeah. Yeah. Thomas Aquinas said, an abuse doesn't nullify a proper use. If you judge any segment of society by its worst examples, nobody could stand. Mm -hmm. We can find people who abuse a doctrine. We don't say because they abuse a doctrine, therefore we should throw, throw doctrine out. Mm -hmm. I've seen people abuse a scripture too. I don't say because of that, I should throw scripture out. Yeah. And so we have one last question. Uh, and it relates to what we've been talking about here. He's, uh, the, the person says the, uh, the Literary Life podcast on the Great Divorce uh, references the, I can't see the edge. Dream motif, it says, dream motif. Um, as a way of making it clear that this is not meant to be a factual thesis on what heaven and hell is like, but to illustrate truth. Do you agree? Yeah, I would. I would. I, I think, though, that Lewis uses the dream motif, but remember, he's, he's embellishing or he's using um, Dante. And Dante also, in the Divine Comedy, has it a dream at the end of the day. Uh -huh. So Lewis is being consistent with the model that he's borrowed from. But I think even if Lewis hadn't used a dream motif, because he's writing fiction, we should also guard ourselves mm -hmm. from um, absolutizing what he said in the fiction. So I, I think, Monique, your, your, your question's a good one. But, but I think that there are several things that would, that would um, allow us to come to that conclusion. So uh, I said one last question, but that's kind of like, I'm going to do like a, um, Baptist preacher, and you know, when he says my last point, and you say, what Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. What does oh, that mean? Philippians, too, he says, finally, several times. Yeah. Um, so, how would you describe Lewis's view of scripture? How, how did he see scripture? What, what kind of view of scripture did he have? Well, Lewis, Lewis had a high view of its authority, he didn't believe in it as a book that was inerrant. I don't think that his argument is very good. He talks about things like the discrepancy between the Matthew 1 genealogy of Jesus and the Luke 3 genealogy of Jesus. There's no discrepancy between those two. They're blatantly different. But how many genealogies do you have, Bill? I think you have two too. You had a mother and a father. And why didn't Lewis think about that? Why didn't he say, oh, uh, yeah, one of them must be Mary's genealogy. And I'd say the Luke 3 one that goes all the way back to Eve and the fulfillment of the promise that was made to the woman comes down to us through Mary. And then the other one is the legal, regal genealogy. Interestingly enough, that includes not only Abraham and David, but it also includes Jeconia. And Jeconiah, I mean, and Jeconiah was the king who was told none of your descendants will sit on the throne of David. And consequently, it's legal, regal to Joseph, but Joseph wasn't the biological father of Jesus. And Nathan's, David's son Nathan, comes down to us through Mary's genealogy. So the, the prophecy is still fulfilled, and it's so, so particularly fulfilled, it, assume, it, 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 it reveals the authority of Scripture even stronger. Lewis misses it. He also talks about the fact that in uh, 1 Corinthians 7, these are just a couple of examples. 1 Corinthians 7, Paul's writing on divorce. And he said, the Lord said, not I. And he talks about some things Jesus said about divorce. And then he says, I say, not the Lord. And so Paul's, uh, Lewis thinks that Paul's going off record and not writing under inspiration of the Holy Spirit when he writes that second thing. But later at the very end, Paul says, and I think I too have the spirit of the Lord. So what Paul's doing in 1 Corinthians 7 is he's saying, Jesus said this about divorce. I'm now telling you this, where I'm taking application of what he said, <clears throat> and I'm applying it to new circumstances that have come out. And, and I think we can do that sort of thing. I mean, it happens in the Old Testament where Moses gives the, the right of inheritance in the Old Testament, and everything was going to come down through the male heirs. And as soon as he gives God's pronouncement on it, the five daughters of Zelophehad say, we don't think this is fair. If I'd have been there, I'd have moved away from him because the ground was known to swallow some people up in those days. 
But Moses to his credit says, tell me what you're thinking. They said, the way this is done, our father's legacy, because he has no sons, it will go to our uncle's sons, our cousins, and our father's legacy will be lost to his own descendants. So Moses says, that's interesting. He goes to God with the daughters of Zelophehad's question, and God says, the daughters of Zelophehad are right. In other words, God gives his word, but he also reinforces and encourages the proper application of his word. So here's Paul writing this way. Lewis misses it completely. And the thing is, I think Lewis is brilliant. But even, even, even the best of us can make mistakes. Mm -hmm. I wish I could fire on as many cylinders as Lewis tends to always fire on. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's easy to find something that we don't like and then project it on more of Lewis. And his, mm -hmm. but I don't think that's fair either. But anyway, I, he had a high view of scripture. There's a place too where he writes, Pascal said this, and the scripture said this. Clearly, Pascal is wrong. The fact that Pascal said something contrary to scripture was enough for Lewis to just mm -hmm. dismiss at that point. Well, that shows the level of his high view. Well, one last, last, last question. Yeah. Um, could you just take a minute as we do really do finish up this time and tell folks about the, uh, your book that was recently published? The Neglected C.S. Lewis? Yes. Yeah, it came out at the beginning of the summer. And, and it's a, I did it with Mark Neal. I've already done another book with Neal on... Um, Lewis's imagination, there's 31 different ways he uses the imagination. But, but um, this particular book looks at eight books that Lewis has written that people usually avoid. Lewis's best books are his literary criticism, and most people don't read them. And, and people are, I think, nervous when they look at uh, English literature in the 16th century excluding drama. It's a 700-page book. You laugh your way through that book. Lewis is a brilliant writer, incisive. He writes with clarity. He writes with imaginative depictions, if you understand. And he also writes with great good humor. So most people don't read that book. We want to give them an introduction to it. The Allegory of Love was a book that established Lewis's literary reputation at Oxford University. That's another one we looked at. The Discarded Image, his book, 29 years worth of lectures he gave at Oxford and Cambridge on the medieval worldview so that you could read a medieval book not project 21st century values into that book. So we look at eight of these books, and that was the one that was recently out. Then I've got another one coming out at the end of October uh, with from InterVarsity Press called Dime. Uh, it's called Splendor in the Dark, which is uh, this. I, it, it's a line from the poem, but I think there's some splendor even in Lewis's dark pre-Christian days that's mm -hmm. starting to emerge. So those are the, the most recent. I'm working on a couple other books too. Yeah, I, uh, recently, uh, in the past year, I was part of a um, team teaching a course on Lewis. And I went back and read, um, in particularly in the phase of his life where he was um, coming back from the war and the kinds of questions that were stirring, you know, in his mind at that time and what he had seen in World War I and the, you know, destruction and death of friends and that kind of thing. And I was fascinated by what God was stirring in his heart and the questions that were arising from that, that eventually, you know, moved him in the, in the direction that he ended up. But those questions and the poetry that he wrote and you know, it was just uh, fascinating to me, so. Well, he's decidedly an atheist when he produces his first book, Spirits and Bondage. It came out in 1918, the war ended in, uh, it came out in 1919, the war ended in 1918. Most of those poems he had written before the war and during the war. As a matter of fact, in the first edition, if you look at it, there's an advertisement in the back and he's included Sassoon and Wilfred Owen and so on. So he, he didn't go on to do much poetry. Jeff Davis, who's a uh, dean of the humanities here at Wheaton, says the thing that gave us the great C.S. Lewis was his, was his poetry. He wrote such bad poetry, and it was so uh, scoffed and looked down upon by the, by the literary public that Lewis went to fiction, and that's why we've got the great C.S. Lewis that we have today. Well, that's interesting. But in Spirits and Bondage, though he's an atheist, mm -hmm. 
And, and Lewis even says in Surprised by Joy, with the bombs bursting all around him, he never lowered himself to pray. Mm -hmm. He doesn't pray out, God help me, God help me. There's mm -hmm. no foxhole conversions on his part. He's decidedly atheist. But, but you cannot, even as an atheist, eclipse what Peter Berger in Rumor of Angels, the great sociologist, called signals of transcendence, mm -hmm. the heart crying out to God. And he's got a poem in Spirits and Bondage called In Praise of Simple Folk. He's got others that, are, that depict the longing that he describes haunted him. Even in Surprise by Joy, these longings haunted him since his childhood. Right. Because George MacDonald had already planted yeah. The, yeah. the seed there in Van Hastings. And, and yeah. Uh, yeah, so Jerry, thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, if, if we could all clap, we would all clap now for just... Um, you don't need to clap. Site. And um, I'm happy to do this, Bill. I love this stuff. Yeah. Anytime, anytime I can serve you and we can make the times mesh, I'm, I'm available. Um, this is fun I, for me. I'd like to uh, maybe do some of the more, some of the uh, less read books, some of his you know, books that haven't been, is, are not as popular. Yeah. Try to get uh, folks to, you know, branch out some from the, um, I know, uh, one that's a little, little more difficult to read is Miracles, which is a great, you know, book. And um, it's his most complex apologetic book, and yeah. I think his most his most refined apologetic book. Mm -hmm. So we'll definitely be in in touch and, and uh, maybe do uh, some more of the fiction. And um, so what I'd say to uh, people who are still with us, uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Let us know if um, there's some particular one of Lewis's books that you would like to have us address one month. And we'll definitely be in touch, Jerry. So everyone have, have a great evening and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Blessings. Well,